Good afternoon, Thistle fans, and welcome to another of our In Lockdown With interviews with former Jags legends. I'm delighted to be joined this afternoon by Mr. Conrad Balatoni. Conrad, welcome. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Looking forward to it. No problems. Absolute pleasure. Um, how have you and the, the family been surviving the past nine, ten months or so? Uh, not too bad. Um, in the fortunate position that we both have been able to work throughout the the pandemic and the lockdowns. Uh, my partner's a deputy head teacher, so she's you know quite um, she's having to work pretty much all the way through it, um, going into schools and stuff now as well. Myself, you know, with my business, um, been really busy last year. So for me, it was quite surprising that you know the amount of business that I actually did do, um, considering that we were, everyone was in lockdown. But everyone's just kind of taken on board the whole virtual kind of meetings and stuff like that. So it's not really affected me massively and hopefully over the next few months when the virus kind of settles down and cases come down, we can start meeting, I can start meeting people back face-to-face in coffee shops and Good. taking them out for lunch. So it's been not too bad. Brilliant, brilliant. Right, give you a, we'll give you the chance, give your business a plug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I don't know if anyone knows, people might know, uh, I'm a now a financial advisor, uh, myself, Conor Bell, Tony Wealth Management. Um, you can find me on Facebook, find me on Instagram, uh, anyone wants a chat about anything just feel free to drop me a message i deal with life insurance uh, critical illness insurance pensions investments inheritance tax um, a wide range of things so yeah there you go cool cool yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say for anything that our sock sponsor can't cover maybe conrad can so uh <laughs> check that out on facebook and you can conrad you can probably expect a phone call from our commercial manager in about 10 seconds after this goes out so <laughs> <laughs> it's all good it's all good let's go back then um life before that so um your development as a young footballer what was what was your journey like in youth football when you know you can obviously touch on hearts and just how close you got to kind of making the grade there yeah, so started off as obviously I'm from Leeds, so played football all, all the way down Leeds and then moved up to Edinburgh when I was, I think, eight years old. Um, joined a local team in Edinburgh called Ferniside. Um, really good bunch of lads. Um, a lot of boys from my school were playing there for some reason. I don't know why, because it was a little bit f- further away. Um, ended up getting scouted for Hearts, was at uh, Hearts, and just you know kind of took off from there. Managed to get myself a pre contract when I was 15 years old to go, you know, professional. Um, I think there was, from what I'd gathered, there was a little bit of interest in another couple of clubs. Um, and because of I was coming up to that age where I could sign new deals or, or you know, uh, apprentices at that time, mm-hmm. I think they wanted to tie me and a couple of other lads down. So I was fortunate enough to, you know, going into, I think I was going into fifth year knowing that I'd basically got a job at the end of my year. So I kind of probably ruined me a wee bit at school that because uh, I knew I was going to go do my dream job. Who was it that who, who who was it you signed for under Hearts? Who was coaching at that point? Oh, um, it's a tough question because there was a lot of managers uh, at that time. I think when I first went into my apprentice, it would have been John McGlynn, maybe. I actually, John, I actually, I don't know, um, and I never for some reason I never really n- noticed managers until like the foreign ones came in or when I started kind of getting into the the first team mix mm-hmm. um, but I think at the very beginning it was just you know I think it was like Stevie Freel and John McGlynn and stuff like that so there was a lot of like um, play, uh, people that had been there for a while and then the one that I remember most was probably Chavel Aslo because he was the first manager that kind of took me into the first ball that I think it was I was only about 18 at the time and I was then training with them pretty much every day in the match day squads. And it was, um, that was probably the main manager that I, I remember at my heart's days. And then a lot of the managers kind of came to and from, from with obviously the Romanoff era. So it was a bit of a, yeah. a bit all over the place, to be honest. An, an interesting time. Were you centre half all the time up until that point, were you? Uh, started off as a centre mid when I was um, playing youth, and I came when I got a tr- when I got the chance to come to Hearts. I actually wanted to play centre mid, and I never thought I'd go to centre half because I thought I'm not going to be a centre half. I've got too much ability. <laughs> and at that time, when you're playing boys club, I was without being big headed. You know, I was head and shoulders above a lot of the players that I was playing against. So I was thinking, oh, I'm, I'm a really good player here. And when you go into a professional setup and you've got other players that are just as good, if not better than you, 
you realise actually you might not be one of the best players there. Mm-hmm. So when I was playing centre mid, you realise actually these boys are better than me at centre mid. So why would I give myself less of a chance to play? Whereas actually I knew that I was probably better at centre half than what the other players were. So I just mm-hmm. was like, I'll, I'll drop down. And then I realised I had my, my thinking cap on. I thought, my centre half doesn't run. So when I'm older, I can keep playing. <laughs> <laughs> but nah, and, and I never thought I'd become a centre half. But you know, it's funny how things like that happen. Because um, I remember actually one time one of our coaches, I think it was under 14s or 15s, asked us to write down what positions we wanted to be or wanted to play. And I remember I put centre mid, right wing, and right back, and that was it. <laughs> and then you ended up suddenly, suddenly I'm playing centre half, and I've played that my whole career. So it's just funny that these things can happen. Yeah, yeah, we've talked a lot. We've talked, I speak to David Irons last week. He made that transition. Obviously, Senna for how now is he, he, he played centre half, went to the midfield and come back. You're seeing it at Liverpool at the moment in the first team that central midfielders fill in that. So, I guess there's something about the knowledge you accumulate in the middle of the park that when you take the step back, you, you, you see the wider game. In my opinion, I think sometimes if you can convert a decent centre, like a centre mid into a centre half, you, you've literally want to you wanna watch because. Centre mid, they're good on the ball, they're fit, they can get about, they read the game well. The only problem that they might not have is they might not be as tall and they might not be as dominant in the air as what you'd want a centre half to be. And that's the only problem. But if you can have a centre half that's decent on the ball, you know, read the game quick, you know, in this day and age, that's probably all you really need because the ball's always on yeah. the deck, especially down in England anyway. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, how did you? How, how did the first loan spell with this come about? Um, so, when I was at Hearts, we had Neil McCann, who was a first team player, and I got on quite well with Neil. Uh, and we kept in touch when he kind of retired. Um, and he, when he left Hearts, he ended up kind of joining his agent's firm as like a kind of like a go between, just you know, a, someone just to kind of introduce to his agent. And he contacted me and he just said, look, do you have a chat? So had a chat. Next thing we know, you know, I'd signed up with him and his uh, his proper agent. And he was like, look, I think I might have a team for you. And then he was really good friends with Jackie McNamara, who was obviously at Thistle at the time. Mm-hmm. But he was in with Jackie. Jackie was in with Ian McCall at the time. It kind of just spiraled. Mm-hmm. They asked me to come along for training. I think we put a training session and I think we played Celtic reserve squad at Lennox Town. And I think we maybe beat them. And I remember specifically, um, I came off the pitch. I think I played 70 minutes. I think Willie Kinneber was uh, playing beside me. I think I came off after 70, 80 minutes, 75 minutes, whatever it was. And Ian McCall looked at me and he just went, you're a good player. And I thought, well, I must have done well then. And then literally after that, he, he obviously signed me on the, the six-month deal. So I was very mm-hmm. grateful. So you got off to a good start, obviously. The manager's back for how these things turn out, but um, you yeah, enjoyed playing under him. Yeah, it was it was great. It was a completely different learning curve, um, and I think I've, I've been very honest about this. You know, I was still a very young boy at that time. Probably wasn't physically developed, wasn't um, experienced, but going out there really taught me a lot. And Ian McCall was great. Um, you know, I, I actually got on really well with him. Still to this day, obviously, I was at A United with him as well, so um, got a lot of time for him. And just what he would tell you and what he would, you know, do in the dressing room was completely different to what a youth manager would do. So, you know, having a talent and bowling. So, you know, at that time I was young, I would, I would make a mistake and he was, he was, you know, he was tough on me, but he was also, he understood that I was young and I would make mistakes, but that's what he, he took a gamble on me and he obviously rated the player. So I've got nothing but obviously positive, um, Thoughts on him? It was a bit of a hospital question. You've got to say you like him, don't you? So, <laughs> but that uh, <laughs> um, that you, you, you mentioned you were young. You were nineteen when you made your Thistle debut. Do you remember it? Um, no. <laughs> uh, right. Okay, we we'll skip on. Who, who was it? Who was it against? Uh, Race Rovers away. Oh, a four goal no, thriller. Okay. Four goal thriller. Okay. Let's just put it that way. Who who got someone got sent off? Didn't they? Um, was well, it Willie Kinnebrew? Willie Kinnebrew got sent off in the first half and we got beat 4-0. I came on at half-time. I remember that. We got beat 4-0, yeah. yeah. Not ideal. Exactly. 
we'll, we'll, we'll move swiftly on from that one. Um, what, what do you remember about that first loan spell then? Um, you know, you're just wanting game time and learning at that stage. Yeah, just at that time, you know, I was still in the mindset of, you know, go up. Oh. If I'm being honest, what I thought was, I'm 19 now, and I knew players that were like 20, 21, that had just hung around hearts, done nothing, not really played any games, and they were just mm-hmm. stale. And I always said to myself, and that's like my mum was quite a big influence on me, so I always said to my mum, if I can go out and get games at a decent age and play in a first team, if I, if I never make the grade at hearts, at least I'll have played 20, 30, 40 games at a first team, yeah. which would then give me the opportunity to potentially get another club in the Championship or in the Premier League. And that was my thinking behind it. My, obviously, my first thought was, go out there, do well, go back to Hearts, try and stake a claim for a place there. But my second thought was, go out, get experience, get my name in and around first team managers, coaches, do well, and then you never know what could happen. Mm. And that, that was it. So I always thought there was two reasons for me going out on loan. And I, I just, I didn't want to be one of these players that regretted not going out on loan because there's a lot of people mm. that I have that says, oh, I wish I'd went out alone at 19 instead of like trying to break it into the first team when they were never going to. So when, when Jackie asked you back the second time around, that easy decision for you and to me? Yeah, so, because in my first year, was McCall the manager the full year there or was it only half? Oh, I need to check off dates, hold on. I remember the first year, because it was... Uh, cause he I, would I have been... I'm pretty sure McCall was the first year there, wasn't he? And then yeah. Jack came in the second year at the beginning and I came on loan. And then I signed permanently in the second half of that season. Yeah. Um, that's right, that's right. January 2012. But you already clearly had that relationship with Jackie. and Yeah. So, Jack, so this is a funny story, but no funny story, but... I used to car share with Jackie, so we were really close when we when we travelled. And although I pretty much abused him for travelling because I was I was skint all the time, so I didn't even want to travel. My, <laughs> didn't even want to drive my car, time, which is I feel bad for now, but you know, it is what it is. Um, but Jackie always used to speak to me about when he was going in for the Falkirk job with Neil McCann. I think remember when Stephen Presley got it, yeah. And he, you know, he he spoke to me and he was like, you know, like we were going to make you one of our first signings at Falkirk because we both rated you and we wanted you to um, come in. You know, you, you, I would have still been young at that time. So we wanted me to kind of come in, be in with the first team, but play reserve games and then, you know, gradually build myself into the first. That's what he said to me. So I thought, brilliant, this guy, you know, really rates me. Like that. That's a massive compliment for two Celtic, uh, for two Scottish kind of international players to say that about you. Mm-hmm. So I was delighted. And then obviously he got the, he got the job and, um, it just kind of like, you know, I don't think I would have went anywhere else um, apart from when I when I left the second year in the, in the January and I went back to Hearts. I think I was injured at the time mm-hmm. and I knew that I was going to be paid up by Hearts and I was going to be a free agent. I basically agreed with Thistle, everything. Um, we can get onto that story later, but mm-hmm. it was always going to be there, even though I had another option um, right at the last minute, which was more money and... Um, but yeah, it was always going to be Jackie because of because I respected him, I, I rated him, and I thought what he was going to do was going to be very special, and you know it kind of turned out to be true. So yeah, not that. So it feels like you almost built yourself up to the reality of moving on from Hearts. So did that make it less of a a wrench? Was it still quite an emotional thing to yeah, say goodbye I, to that? I so when when my first year finished, um, Jim Jeffries was the manager at this time. I remember this really well because. I went and seen him and I says, look, like, what's the plans? Like, I've just been out for a year on loan, like, you know, and he, and he was like, look, you're not going to be my plans or like, you're not going to be part of the training squad. I thought, so I said to him, I says, look, like, you've not even seen me. You've no, what, you're not judging me. Like, I've been out for a year now. I've got some experience. Why don't you have another look at me? And he was like, he turned around and he went, do you know what, fair play. Um, you're right in what you're saying. And then ne- literally, next thing I know, I was on the plane to Italy with him in the first team squad. So from that conversation I had with him, I managed to wrangle my way out to Italy with the first team. And I thought, right, I can do well here, then I'll maybe get a wee chance. And I did all right. I wasn't I wasn't amazing. It was still maybe a little bit too early for me to play with that calibre of player, um, if I'm being honest. But um, I thought I, I thought I still had ability myself. And, you know, it was just a matter of time. Maybe I was a wee bit nervous as well. Because, you know, you're going into a first team with these big players 
and you know you're a young lad and you know maybe just thinking that you're not good enough anyway uh, and then he basically says like oh you're not going to go out on loan again um, and then I thought right well that's probably probably going to be it then so I got another loan with Thistle and then the January came and then basically they said to me I think it was at that time Paolo Sergio I think was the manager at that time and he then basically he didn't look at me once so I think a few of the loan players came back and they basically just made me train with I think it was four of the players in the afternoon so basically got banished from the first team, the 19s, and we were just kind of in a in a, a group of four or five of us having a train until each of us just kind of gradually left. So ended up taking a, a payoff in January, and then that's when I signed for, for Thistle. Great to be fans jumping at the bit for us to get to the the 2012-13 the season here and talk all about that. So we won't hang about much more. You obviously spent that remainder of the season before. Even then, could you see the foundations being put in place for something that was, as you say, going to be pretty special? Yeah, so, I mean, that, that's what I just spoke about earlier. You know, I had another offer. A United came in for me at the last minute um, and on, on a lot more money than what Thistle. I, mean, I was signed for Thistle for 50 quid a week at that time. And I was, you know, tra- it wasn't even covering my petrol because I couldn't travel in with a manager. So I was travelling in by myself. So, you know, I, I took the gamble of saying, right, I'm going to go this all stay full time because I think what he's going to do is going to be really, really good. I think, you know, he's building up that season to go again the next season. And um, obviously, you know, I, I went there for the remainder of that season and then signed a new deal in in the summer, which was obviously a lot more money for me. And, you know, I was more than happy. And a few boys that I knew signed for them as well. And it just, obviously, the rest is history, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've been talking about that, that season for for hours. I guess the thing that became more and more evident as the season unfolded was the, the team spirit and the squad spirit. And especially after you had a couple of bumps in the road, if you like, that you, you weren't expecting. Was that something that naturally evolved or did you guys really work on it? What Probably a bit of a combination of the two. It was, it was probably nat- all natural. Um, I think everyone in the dressing room was really just really fitted in well with each other. We had some big characters there. I mean, a lot of people probably forget this, but, you know, Hugh Murray, when he was in that dressing room at that, um, in that season, he was incredible. He was so funny. And he just was like, even though he may, might not have played every single game, he was always bouncing about and he was keeping the boys together and, you know, laughing and, you know, you could go to him if you were down or if anything happened, you could speak to him because he had the experience of it. You know, Steph Craig as well, really great lad. Um, and then you got all the younger lads, you know, like myself, Welshade, Lawless, who had all been kind of released, James Craig and coming up from uni, all having to kind of prove a point. And everyone was just in it together. Like, it, it was it's a, a cliche saying, but we were literally just in it together and that was it. We just... We clicked. We didn't have any, you know, bad uh, bad people in the dressing room that, you know, caused problems. We never, you know, no one really fell out. And it was always, you know, good banter in the dressing room and it just kind of kept going and going. And then obviously that happened. People left, but you you would we replace them and that's just the way it happened. It worked. Mm-hmm. You, would, um, you would score six goals that season, if I'm right. Pretty good return for a centre half. Was it not seven or eight? Seven or eight. I'm and maybe sure. just talking league goals. Um, uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. You know, is that the midfielder shining through? Um, was it? You know, just a purple patch. What? What was your favourite goal that season? Can you? You know what? I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, that season, everything just clicked for me. Um, I kind of started. I started playing really well, and I started kind of feeling like I was. I was belonging in a first team environment. Um, and I, w- I could have been like the main the main guy, um, but for my goals, I always I always had and I still do. I always have that near post run down to a T, and I know exactly what to do. And I've been doing it for years and years and years. And when you've got someone like Ross Forbes who could deliver the way that he delivered, you knew that if you kept on doing that, majority of the time you'll get a chance. And it kind of yeah proved that you know there was always. Any near post run, if I, you know, sometimes you won't always get it, but I'd always get a wee bit in front of my my man, and I'd, if it was a good enough cross for me in the area that I needed it to be, you know, I'd usually make contact with it, and that's just yeah. the way it was. Just 
fortunate. Um, you know, I was able to keep going and obviously uh, the goals that I scored, I think my favourite one would have to be the Dunfermline one. Yeah. Because, you know, at the magnitude of that game at that time, um, but just for pure what it meant in the title race, the Edry goal yeah. that um, equalised. As much as I never got to celebrate because I was straight back down the pitch. <laughs> and the game just as well. Um, then I, what is it? You know, it, for importance, that's probably my most important goal. Yeah, yeah. Is it, have you ever experienced a game like that in your career? Another one like it? Nah, not not because of what the what the game meant. You know, we knew that if we'd won or if we got beaten, Morton. Um, no, sorry, because it was after the Morton game, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. It was yeah. three days like after the Morton so game. Which... We 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 knew that if we beat so we beat Morton, we thought well, there's no point in beating Morton and then losing to Edry because Morton will probably win. And luckily for us, you know, we managed to win and they dropped points again. But we were thinking, you know, if, if we lose here, it just defeats the whole purpose of all the hard work that we've done. On, mm-hmm. I think it was the Wednesday night, wasn't it? So, it was, I mean, that was a hell of a week. It was Sunday, Ramson's final. Sunday, Wednesday. Wednesday, Wednesday Morton, Saturday, Edry. And, you know, the, the Sunday was a hell of a sore one, obviously, for everyone. But, to come back and especially when on the Wednesday night showed, you know, enormous character. Yeah, I, always, I mean that's it's, it's one of these things, you know. You always lose games, and obviously the Ramsons Cup was was massive for the fans and for us players. So we thought, you know, we could do a double here, and you know, you wanted to do that as a player. And then, um, you know, you get to so close on penalties, and then stupid old me misses. So <laughs> what can you do? Eh? But now, nah, like the boys bounced back brilliantly, and I. I as much as like I was gutted on the Sunday, uh, yeah, on the Sunday against um, Queen of the South, I actually I wasn't on the Monday. I was just like I was back to normal because I thought, right, there's a massive game on Wednesday. I can't yeah. be, I can't be like feeling sorry for myself. And I actually think the Wednesday game I played really, really well. Me and Arrow, um, and obviously we kept the clean sheet, so I was a bit like made up for it a wee bit, you know, because we beat nearest rivals and we were kind of one hand on the trophy at that time, so. It was um, really important, and it was just making sure that you know you, you didn't have any of that um, hangover from the from the cup final. Mm-hmm. So that was important. But obviously, everyone everyone played their part. I think, especially with 120 minutes in the legs, which would probably be the most the, the thing we wanted the least of all heading into that Wednesday. And um, I, I, I suppose going back to the Ramsons game, have you ever crossed paths with Lee Robinson since that? Because He's probably have, still on that pitch, wasting time. I have actually, yeah. I, I trained with Queen of the South for a bit just to keep my fitness up a few years ago. Um, I actually never said anything, to be honest, because I forgot. I tried to forget about it, but um, <laughs> he's, he's all right. I mean, it was just one of these things. I mean, I still, yeah. if I'm being honest, I'm going to put these, I'm going to um, put them uh, on the spot here, but you had the likes of uh, Christy Elliott, who was at that time playing as a striker, yeah. Not take a penalty, and I was having to take it before him, so I blame him. <laughs> you put your hand up. I think it was I think it was Christy and Jai C that never took a penalty, if my memory corrects me. Um, and I was I, I, I still say to them sometimes now, like if they bring it up, or you know you're the ones that never stepped up, and I was you got a centre half to take a penalty when it should have been you guys, and as as a joke and that, but yeah, yeah we just got to deal with it. <laughs> but as you as, as you say, three nights. Three days later, playing Morton in front of a massive crowd. You guys are waiting in the changing room before the game. The game's delayed because the, the, the crowd's so big. You know, do you still look back in that? I think everyone, whenever they watch that James Craig and goal, still get kind of shiver down their spine. How was that? You know, the feeling for you that night? Oh, it was great. I mean, like you said, you know, you're coming off a a negative and then you're going straight into a positive. Where you're finishing on a positive after the game, so it's uh, it's incredible. You know, you've seen that and you think. You know, we, I think we averaged maybe three or 4,000 fans that season and then suddenly you've got a, a fan, a game of, you know, I think it was, what, 10,000, 11,000 fans maybe? Uh, so like, towards about eight or nine, I think, at least. It might be uh, 10, yeah. But whatever it was, you know, you're looking at that and you're thinking, oh, you know, this is, this is big. And we, we knew it was big. And obviously we, we'd had all the stuff in the papers by Alan Moore, the Morton manager at the time, you know, about us. And being inexperienced and you know won't win anything with kids and stuff like that so 
Um, we knew what was at stake. We knew we always we were so confident. But we were young. We just thought no one's going to beat us. We had the, we had the energy, and we knew that Morton had a an aging squad, and we knew that we'd beat them if we were if everyone turned up. And it was just making sure everyone turned up for the night. And you know we did, and we actually we never we were never in doubt of not beating them once we scored. I thought we were so comfortable. Still, don't, I really don't think we even had a a clear cut chance in that game. If I'm being honest, from what I remember, yeah. but. It was a nerve-wracking night, just in the sense that there was always just one goal in it, and you never know what might happen. But it was, it wasn't uncomfortable in terms of the, the domination. So, a fantastic night. You've talked about, you know, around that Airdrie game, and even probably after the Morton game, you, you, you maybe thought we got this, as you, as you obviously said throughout the season. Going back a step when, when Jackie and said moved on, what was the, what was the feeling in the squad at that time, and you know, what, what did that, you know, how did you manage to turn that into something that? you know, just really gain momentum from there? It was weird because, I mean, it kind of happened also quick with six months in, I think it was, and then suddenly they're away and it's like, right, oh, you know, however long they were in, in charge. And we were like young and if I'm being honest, I think most of the players were thinking, who's he going to take from the squad and take take to Dundee United with, you know, because mm-hmm. boys were a contract at the end of the year, boys could have signed pre-contracts, obviously Pates and Squiddy did, um, but a lot of the players were young and we thought, you know, we, I, I certainly did. I thought, you know, I might have a chance here of him coming in and bringing me with him. And it, as much as, like, you know, it never happened, you still think the what if. Um, and obviously, you know, Dundee United at that time were probably paying a lot more money than what Patrick Thistle were. But I think a lot of boys obviously wanted to progress their career and they maybe have thought going with Jackie and Sid would have done that. Um, but yeah, it was one of these things we, we just were kind of like, oh, this is. It's not ideal. We didn't know who was going to come in. We had rumours. We had rumours of certain managers that we just thought, nah, nah, we don't want them. We don't want them. And obviously, Archie getting the job. Um, it all just kind of, kind of went from there. Um, he came in, and I think if you remember at the beginning of the year, or there was a part, a patch where we were doing really, really poorly away from home, and we were we weren't picking up many points. Mm-hmm. And he actually came in and he rectified that. Um, just by doing a little bit of shape work and stuff. And I always said this, you know, we wouldn't have probably won the league without Jackie, but we wouldn't have won the league without Archie, if that makes sense. So mm-hmm. I, I know a lot of fans have a lot of hate towards Jackie um, and the time before it, but they also got to realise that if it wasn't for those two, the squad would have never been put together the way it was. Yeah. And they never would have had the start that, they would have, that, that we had. And then if it wasn't for Archie, then we wouldn't have probably had the wouldn't have been able to go over the finish line because I just thought he brought out that that nitty gritty there where we could see things over the line, get the one nils, get the two ones and stuff like that, and just keep picking up points on the roads and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. you know, it was just a smooth. I th- yeah, I, th- I think I think you're spot on. I think most fans would would be able to differentiate the two and say they'd probably still always be upset by the fact he left and probably the speed in which that happened which is probably just football um, but always be able to acknowledge the fact that the foundations were very much put in place not just yeah. in terms of personnel but a, a style of play that we maybe started with with and Ian, Mc, th- Ian McCall and built from there I think what a lot of people maybe don't realise as well is that Jackie and Simon actually behind the scenes started started the foundation for probably what the club are at now um, and obviously Archie overtaking it and taking it to that next level as well. So, you know, it's just one of these things. That's football. I mean, we as players, we understood that. And we knew that, you know, people could come, people could go. And it's just, you know, you just got to do it for yourself and for your teammates who's there at the, at the end of the day. And we were all, you know, we all had the same goal, no matter what. We wanted to win the league. We all wanted to get back up to the, to the Premier League because at the end of the day, a promotion for most of us meant increase in our salaries, increase in our bonuses. So, it was a win-win for for everyone in that squad, so you know, we never never once kind of turned around and says, "Oh, I'm not enjoying it. I don't want to, you know, not fussed if we go up on that." It was literally we want to go up, we want to do this, we want to get up there, we want to play against the best players in Scotland. So yeah. it was it wouldn't have mattered. I'm not going to say that because it might have mattered, but you know when I actually got the job and. I think it was just it was a lot of relief knowing that hey someone knew the boys knew what it was like and um, to take it and just take it on and keep building and building and you know 
his record sp- spoke for itself when he was in the Premier League until obviously the, the relegation season. Yeah, yeah. Just finishing off that season then, um, you know, get, did, did, did all the hard work, got it over the line, Falkirk away, another day that will live long in the memories and obviously Dunfermline at home. <laughs> what the, the celebrations must have been enjoyable after so much toil. I remember yeah. you all coming into the pub, the Star and Garter down the road from Fort Hill and bringing the trophy in and it was just electric. It's, it's, it's mad because like, do you know what, um, in football, well for me personally, I think, I, I think most players... You can win trophies and you can win that, but what actually sticks with you is the celebrations after the game. And like, I don't really remember much from the games. I can like, I can, very um, hazy memory from a lot of the games that I played in. But what I do remember is the celebrations from winning that that league. And I remember me, Welshie, and uh, James Cragen. We used to car share through from Edinburgh, and after every training session, we'd go to um, Virgin Active Gym in Fountain Park, and we used to like. You know, do our do our workout, and then we go sit in the jacuzzi and just literally chat and say, "Imagine we win this league. Imagine we win this league. Like, what's it going to be like? You know, celebrations. I'm like, oh, we'll be out for days, and we'll we'll, we'll do all this, and you know, you'll not see me for a week and stuff like that. Like, oh, well, I'll I'll end up single and all that. It's just like, yeah, like, and literally, you win the league, and then it's like the celebration of kind of Falkirk was just amazing. You know, you win that, everything just you, know, you can just relax. You you've done it. The fans behind the gate uh, behind the um, behind the goal doing the, the conga and stuff like that you know it's yeah. brilliant to see and you just think you know you look at the fans and you think we have made literally every one of these people happy and you're thinking you know you don't, not many people can do that in life and that was just something that you know will probably live with a lot of us for for the rest of our days is that you know you can actually make so much joy from football um, just by doing you know things like that winning leagues and stuff so yeah the celebrations were great I think you know went out for a few days after that, and I think that's why we were a bit, we were a bit shaky against Dunfermline. Luckily, we got the got the draw, and then obviously the celebrations continued with the with the um, I think it was a Saturday night there that the club put something on, and then mm. I think the week after that was Dumbarton, wasn't it away? That's right. I think the day after that we were obviously all out for the PFA awards. Had a couple of boys up for the Player of the Year, so it was it was really good. Um, a wee story for you as well. So on the Sunday that we had the PFA Awards, uh, I don't know if you remember, uh, obviously what Alan Moore was saying in the papers about, you know, yeah. you'll, you'll not win anything with kids and that. And, you know, yeah. that we, and as players, we were all just like, you know, what, what a bit of a, you know, whatever it is. Um, I don't want to swear and stuff. <laughs> you can imagine what we were saying. And then yeah. like, we obviously had the T-shirts, you know, kids for your experience and stuff like that. And a lot, we probably used it as a bit of fuel you know, to go on and, and win that league because, you know, I thought, who's this guy like you know, saying that we're not good enough just because we're young? And anyway, so we were in, a, I think it was Nico's in Glasgow and Jordan McMillan had just signed from the film and obviously because they went into administration. Mm-hmm. So he knew Alan Moore. So we were like, we we're all a bit, a bit leery and that, a bit drunk. And uh, <laughs> like, oh, he was like, oh, we'll phone Alan Moore and we'll start singing to him. So <laughs> he got his phone, phoned Alan Moore and we were all singing you should have kept your effing mouth uh, <laughs> and he, he was like who's this who's this and we were just singing it like along like it was so funny and we were just like it was just looking back he just said like why like why did we even do that you know it's quite quite poor but <laughs> we, were, we were just like you know like he deserves it for what he was saying so um caught up uh, in the moment yeah it was it was good man like the, the memories last with me for forever and you know we went to magaluf as well and the boys all went and we we did know that a lot of the players maybe wouldn't have been there next year. So, you know, it was one of these things where, you know, it could potentially be a, a send-off as well. So we wanted to make sure that it was, it was good and enjoyable for everyone. So, yeah, it was um, really enjoyable. Still uh, still look back and have a smile on my face sometimes. You see, you, I'm sure you see it pop up on social media when they do clips to the goals and throwbacks and stuff. And as you see, the, the, the conga behind the goal is quite iconic, but, you know, it's a moment forever. Yeah, ah, it's it's inc- it's great. I mean, I was looking because I think it was in the when we were shooting that way, and you see it, and you just think, oh, brilliant, you know. And then I think just sums up our season the way that uh, Chris Erskine scored that second goal. Just summed up summed up who we were as a team. And when he scores, you just thought, for that set, we've won. And I think you just see the relief on everyone's face when the final whistle goes, you know, hands up in the air, and then we come back up on the 
back on the pitch and you just see myself jumping about, James Craig and jumping about, we're just going around picking up the scarves and that. It's uh, it's brilliant. You know, it's, you don't get many of these days in football. Yeah. And no one, yeah. no one understands. No one, no fan understands what it's like when you when you do that. And you know, it's, I'm in a very lucky position where I've had a career where I've actually you know been able to enjoy something like that. Mm-hmm. Definitely, we only we can only dream, Conrad. So, um, I, I guess you know the next season. Instantly, most people make your favourites to come back down, but um, you know how, how how did you feel you coped with that transition? And was there always belief that you'd have more than enough if you applied yourselves? I I personally, I always thought we were never in any danger of going down, um, and I know we were probably bottom of the league for you know a few weeks, but I never thought we were the worst team in that league, and I think. It sums it up when we played Dundee United first game of the season. We absolutely annihilated them mm-hmm. on the pitch. You know, we were unbelievable hearts as well um, on TV. I think it was a Friday night game. We drew one each, but we were we we played some really really good football. And the problem for us was that we just couldn't score when we were on top, and that's what kind of killed us a little bit. Um, but I, as the season went on, you know, it got a little bit harder. You're playing against better players, but you're also getting better yourself and you're understanding how to play in that league and how what the what the you know what the difference is going to be from championship to Premier Leagues. And you know, we, we got in ourselves in a position, obviously, we needed a point against Hibs and a point against Hearts, and you know, luckily for us we managed to get it against um uh, Hearts at the time. So yeah, it was just one of these things. I, I was always confident I would stay up and I think most people were as well. Um, it was just, mm-hmm. you know, a bit nervy because we were down at the bottom tail end. So it was one of these things that everyone's always going to speculate that you potentially could go. But I never, I was never in any, um, I wasn't scared about going down, put it that way. Mm-hmm. And how, how, you know, that's an achievement in itself, clearly, and it set the platform for this. It'll be a top flight team for a number of years. How, you know, how do you celebrate that, which is obviously a very different set of emotions from winning the title? <laughs> Yeah, it's weird. You kind of feel like you're, you kind of feel embar- not embarrassed, or you're not like in a bad way, but you think you know, you're celebrating because you've been poor and you've managed to stay up, if that makes sense. And it's not the same as winning a league because you've been good, you know, but you are also delighted because you've kept people in jobs, you've kept the club in the in the league, you know, you've got good bonuses coming coming your way. So, Obviously, you're delighted because of all these factors, but also you feel, I felt a wee bit like ashamed because, you know, I thought we were, we we shouldn't have been where we were. You know, we should have been clearer than where we were or higher than where we were. Um, so it was, it was, it was a strange one. But yeah, I mean, still had a few nights out and that and enjoyed myself. So can't complain. Yeah. Yeah. And as you said, you're playing against obviously greater quality of opposition. That match you talked about, Dundee United. Andy Robertson's on the pitch and just look at what he's going to do. So, you know, you're only going to improve as a, a player in that environment. Well, yeah, you look at Dundee United's team then, um, Armstrong, Shiftke, Gold, um, Mackay, Stephen, Robertson, you know, good, good players that have yeah. got and had a very good career. Um, so, you know, you've got, to, you've got to kind of take credit on credit where credit's due. You know, we played them and you know, we've we done well, but you could tell these boys were always going to go and be bigger and better um, than the SPFL. And I remember, I think the one game Andy Robertson played was, I think it was a two each game. Did we draw them two each at Phil? I don't know if it was the first year or the second year that we were up, but mm-hmm. he ran from like literally his 18 yard box and then came back and he, he managed to cut it back. And I think they scored um, to make it two each or two one. But um, it must have been the second year, I think, because Lyle Taylor was there. Mm-hmm. So, so, but yeah, you just knew he was he was he was quality, and obviously he'd taken a step up from I think it was League Two at the time, or wherever they were at Queens Park. So, you know, fair play to him. Mm-hmm. Who, who was your in those two seasons? Who was your toughest opponent when you look back? Um, toughest opponent. It's hard because everyone was tough. You know, you you've obviously got the the Celtics and stuff like that. That were obviously good, but they were, they were different toughness because. You've got to be switched on mentally, whereas in the other games you've maybe got to be more physical because you're playing against teams that maybe just go a bit longer. Um, mm-hmm. It's hard, uh, obviously. <coughs> Shift gate, gold, and all that were, were very good. So you kind of like 
you know, you've got to say them, Armstrong. But I always, it's hard. To, I always say this, and I don't mean to be like, thingy, but it's, I, I, I was never scared playing anyone. And I thought, I'm never going to be, you know, I'm not scared if I come up against him because he plays for Celtic. Or he, him, if he comes up because uh, he plays for Hamilton Ackies, it was just me and my mentality that, you know, if I come up with him and they might be decent, I like the challenge. Now, mm. sometimes better than me, absolutely, but I was never, I never was scared. Um, but I'll just, I'll, I'll give you a straight answer. The big, remember the big boy Calvin Zola for Aberdeen? Oh yeah, yeah. He was a handful just because yeah. he was absolutely massive. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just gonna say him just for an answer. Physical battle. Yeah. Good answer. Good answer. Yeah, I mean, you, you played those three seasons running, thirty plus games, a lot of football, and the two Premier um, League seasons. Can you pick out one game that stands out for you? What was your favourite moment at the top? Uh, of the Premier League. It would probably have been. I think uh, clearly the the Hearts game in the first year when we won four two to stay up was yeah. was great, um, just because of where it was. Been back at my old club, Tynecastle, great stadium. Um, had a few friends playing for them, so it was nice to get one up on them. Um, but then you also look at the Inverness away game where we won four mm. nil. I think it was in the second season. You know, another another great game that we played in uh, Ross County away in the second game of the season in the first year. There's loads of games, um, but yeah, probably the Hearts is probably up there because of what it meant to us and the fans and, you know, staying up. Mm-hmm. And there's clearly lo- loads of goals in, in, in those teams across those two years. You had, a, you know, not just Chris Doolan and Chris Erskine, but Lyle Taylor, who you mentioned, Callum Higginbottom, Stevie Lawless, um, you know, an embarrassment of riches at times. How how enjoyable was it for you at the back when the ball was up the other, the other end of the pitch and you could see them doing their stuff? Yeah, it was, it was great. Um, you know, when we were... I think the second season we probably played better than what we did the first season um, in the SPFL. Yeah. So, you know, it was good because I think when we brought in Lyle Taylor, it was something that we was missing. I've said this before, um, you know, Taylor was a player that we we really needed someone to go in behind, someone to hold the ball up because as a team that, as our team and the way that we played, we needed that outlet and we didn't have that outlet because everyone is good at coming to feet and we needed someone that could run and beyond um, and he brought that different dimension um, to the squad and that was um, well, it was a pleasure when you see what, what he's done now he's had a great career down in England and doing very well for himself at Nottingham Forest so fair play to the lad mm-hmm. but yeah it's good you know we had, had an abundance of talent and you know surprised that a lot of the boys haven't probably went on and done more in the career and played at a higher level but it's not to say that they've not had great careers as well. Yeah, yeah. One, one who obviously has is uh, Stephen O'Donnell, who, you know, looking back at the Serbia game, but you know, one of the, a national hero now. You know, how pleased are you to see someone like Stephen make the, the very most of his opportunity? Yeah, brilliant. I remember Stephen came in really young when I think it was the year before we won the league, and you could just see like what he had. He had pace, he had power, and he had you know he had a good football football and brain but my god could he talk and I mean <laughs> he's a lovely 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 guy and I still speak to him uh, now actually but uh, you know he's, he always had questions and I think if it wasn't for Jackie Mack he would never be where he was now because Jackie Mack was so patient with him whereas I know other managers would have just been like nah, like too much you know, mm-hmm. like, you don't need to be asking. Like, it's just some of the stuff he was asking. Like, you knew what he was asking for, and but other managers probably wouldn't have, you know, responded as well as what Jackie did. Um, and then, obviously, he's take, you know, took on on board and he, he done really, really well. And your fair play to the guy you went down south. Don't think he had the best time down there, but Kilmarnock, he's had a really good couple of years at Kelly, gotten himself in the Scotland squad. And I don't know what happened in the summer, Surprised that he ended up at Motherwell, but you know it just goes to show that football doesn't always give you what what you deserve. So hopefully, you know, I don't know what his contract situation is now, but hopefully he can get himself sorted, whether or not it's in the summer or or now, whatever whatever he's got to do. Mm-hmm. We're talking about kind of around things. I'm just conscious of 
I've kept you a good 50 minutes so far, Conrad. No, um, you're all right. <laughs> um, your last Thistle goal, do you remember that? Um, Come Kelly, on. I think it was. Yeah. That we helped you get the move there? Goal one, was it? We got beat. Yeah. We got that somewhere. 4-1 defeat at home to Kamara, yeah. Because <coughs> remember, we, we were safe and um, they weren't. They needed a win to win. And they could, they they just wanted it more than us, and it was it was a bad bad day for us. But you got to take into context the the situation that we found ourselves in. You know, staying up again, they they needed a win to stay up. It was a tough game, um, but yeah, I got my goal, which unfortunately we never managed to win the game. But take it and add to the tally. Yeah, only time you scored and we didn't win. I didn't One know that. Game, so that, uh, that's a wee fact for you. So, um, but you would you would end up at Kilmarnock, and I guess you know after what was encompassing the loan deals, you know, almost five five full years at Far Hill, yeah. you know, you can explain yourself how how you felt when you you left the club. Yeah, I mean, I was I was disappointed at the time. I think I've made it very well known that my ambition was always to try and get abroad and play abroad. Um, it was just always been something that I fancied doing from a, from a young age. And um, at the time when the second season finished, I went and spoke to the manager. And my contract has kind of stayed the same throughout the last two years. So I wasn't on much money and I was playing pretty much every week. And I know that the boys that were in my position were on more money than me. And I just thought, it's not fair if I'm playing every week. And I was playing well at that time. I thought, um, if I'm a, if I'm not earning, you know, a little bit more money, or basically I wanted to get paid what I thought I was worth to the squad, and um, for what the amount of games I've played over the last couple of years, and what I thought I could bring to the team. Um, and I spoke to Archie at the time, and he just said, "Look, we can't offer you the money that I think you deserve." And he he said it to me. He says, "Look, you deserve to be in more, but we just can't have three centre halves on the money that." You know what we could be paying out, and I was like, "That's actually fine." I says, "Look, I'll um, maybe it's time for me just to to go somewhere else, and you know, try my luck somewhere else, and you know, progress my career or or do whatever." He says, "Yeah, that's fine." He says, "You know, what's your thoughts?" I said, "Well, look, first thought is get abroad, and if not, then potentially go down south." And he went, well, "Look, are you going to try and go anywhere in Scotland?" He says, "Look, I honestly don't want to stay in Scotland." I says, "My, my I'm really set on going abroad." Or trying to try and try my look down League One, League Two in England, and uh, he turned around and said, "No, that's absolutely fine. I respect that, and I, hope, I wish you all the best and stuff." Like that. I said, "That's not fine." So everything, you know, fine. And then, literally, obviously, I was on contract, and I was I was quite confident, you know, thinking, you know, I think I was what 23, 24 at the time that I left, and I played, you know, sixty odd games in the Premier League, seventy odd games in the Premier League at that time. I thought. Good age, played a, played a number of games now since I'm 19. Um, would be maybe worthwhile for someone to to bring me in as a you know down south or abroad or you know that experience. And it just never happened for me, and nothing was coming up. And I thought I was able, I was going to get a contract at Bradford. I went and trial with them. I did really well in a game, and they asked me to go down for a week. Went down, did did well again with them, and they just turned around at the end and just said, "Look, we just don't think you're quite ready to play." In. In this level, at this level, I says, "Why not?" And he went, "Just we don't think you're big enough." And I thought, "Well, I can't, I can't even make myself two inches taller." So didn't do anything about that. So I was back up the road, and I thought, "Right, it's now." I think it was coming up August time, and I thought, "What's going on here?" Um, still nothing. And I knew at that time, Kilmarnock were struggling. You know, they were they were really struggling. They were bottom of the table. I knew Higgy was there. So I was speaking to Higgy quite a lot and he was just like, you need to get yourself in here, mate. Like, you know, you could you could help us massively. So I went in and I managed to get myself in there with Gary Locke and then he signed me. And that's just the way it happened. You know, I, I was never looking to go there. You know, I just needed to, at the end of the day, I had, to, I had just literally bought uh, my first property. So I was living in, a, uh, in my own place with no income coming in since May. So I went June, July, August, and pretty much half of September without an income coming in. So I was like, I need to take something here. So I ended up signing for Kelly and then done really, really well for the first four or five games and they offered me a longer term deal. And then 
obviously everything that happened with Lee Clark and stuff like that happened next. But it was a shame because I actually think I could have, it was one of these things, and I didn't have a pre-season. So that season, I think no matter where I went, I would have struggled towards the end of the season because I didn't have that base level of fitness. I literally went into Kilmarnock, I had a week's training and I was playing against Hearts in the Cup. And that was me. I played 30 games in a row without having a pre-season. And at that level, it was difficult. And I struggled at the end of it. And I think my performances probably showed that. But I was confident that if I got another pre-season under my belt, I would have been able to you know, build on myself. And then obviously spells with Aaron Falkirk and Torquay and, and Edinburgh City. But, you know, looking because- back overall... Um, you know, what, what 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 did the Partick Crystal experience mean to you overall when you look back now? You see, you see all the clubs and I think, oh my God, I'm a journey, journeyman now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, was, I look back and, you know, everything I look back at Crystal where it's, it's just pure fond memories. Um, there's nothing I actually turn around and say, I hated that or I wish that never happened. It's literally everything that I've done, I enjoyed. I made a lot of good friends there um, from staff to players to, to even fans. Um, that I still, you know, speak to. So it is very. It will always hold a special place in my in my heart. So I'm very grateful that I played for the club, and hopefully, you know, I'll be able to get there a lot more. You know, when I hang up my boots in probably the next few years. And wait, wait, where's the medal? Tell me that. It's, over there. <laughs> it's, uh, it's in the bag. In the, it's in the bag in another room. I think it is. No way. Bag. I actually don't, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Usually no, people I, say it's in the attic. So uh, at that, that year, um, I won a lot of the Player of the Year awards um, the year that we won the league. Probably because of my social media presence, to be honest. But I won, I won a lot. So I've got a bag, like I've got a rucksack with like all these medals and all these trophies in it. And I think I've just chucked, because we just moved, we moved house um, and I've not been able to sort them all out. So it's all in a um, it's all in a rucksack somewhere along with my losers medal for the Ramses Cup. All right, well, you can keep that in the bag and you can get the rest out once you get the house sorted and yeah. put them in kind of place. So I know I do. Need um, to that. That's all right. It, it makes a refreshing change from up in the attic. That was different. Um, <laughs> right, toughest que- toughest question now definitely is to try and whittle down all those ex teammates into starting 11 that you think was the best of those you played with while at Hill. Right, okay. I'm going to go for uh, Scott Fox and go... Um, yeah. Uh, do, I, do I have to include myself in this or do I, can I just pick No, you, you, you can bench yourself. So. Okay. Well, I don't That's wanna, if you can find... What I'm going to do is I'm going to put myself out of it and just say the best players that I've played with excluding myself. Apart um, from you, obviously, yeah. yeah. You can give those so, overpaid centre-halves a place. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm going to go for Sod at right back, clearly because of you know yeah. how good he was. Um, I'm going to go for Freddie Franz at right centre half, just because the times that I played with him, we had a really good relationship, and I think we've we've both spoken on podcasts that we've done that you know that we just we just clicked, and it was strange, but we played really well in that second season that we were there, and I, I wish that I managed I was able to play with him a little bit longer, but you know it never happened, and. Leland came in and obviously he's had a great career for himself so uh, Freddie centre half along with obviously Archie Archie was great with me when I was first in and then obviously um, a lot Uh, left back uh, Taylor Sinclair so Sinke left back unbelievable left back same as Sod had a great career as well um, down in England and obviously struggling a bit at Libby now but hopefully we can get somewhere this window Um, Gonna go for Pates as a I'm gonna go for four three three as well, by the way. So I'm gonna go for okay. Pates Pates Sen just because for me he was a centre half dream. He was a, he was a, a rat, he just he would get about, he'd do the he'd do all the dirty work in front of you, which is what you you want as a a, a line um midfield player. And they actually had a no bad ping on him as well. I think a lot of people probably forget whenever yeah. Whenever he got the ball, he was able to ping it 60, 70 yards onto Sod and sink his foot from mm-hmm. either side. So he, he was there. Um, on either side of him will be Welshie because 
he just natural ability was great. Um, probably injuries have killed him a little bit. So he's maybe a little bit fortunate to get in there. But I think, you know, you could see his ability when he played. He was he was fantastic. He could score goals, lay runs into the box. He could tackle. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, probably a player that probably should have had a better career, but because of injuries, has kind of ruined him. But you know, it's just one of these things that he's got to take on on the chin. But yeah, he goes next to Pates on the right hand side, and then Banzo on the on the left hand side. Just because Banzo, great great young player, when I was there, so much energy. Could we used to eat Domino's. I think he probably still does eat Domino's every Tuesday. <laughs> And used to run about ninety minutes on a on a Saturday without you know breaking sweat basically. So, um, him just was everything you needed in a in a midfield three. You know, you had the dirty work and Pates, Welsh, a bit of flair and skill, Banzo, energy to get up and down in the box, um, left sided as well, which balanced it out. And then up front, so this is where it might be a little bit controversial. So I went for Higgy, Callum Higginbotham, or. Yeah the right-hand side, just because, I mean, I only played with him for two years at Thistle, but the year that we stayed up in the first season, he was incredible. I mean, he was he was a disgrace at how good he was, like the assists that he got in the goals. Um, and it was just one of these things that I just didn't think I could leave him out because on his day, he could literally do what he wanted. Mm-hmm. So he'll go there. I mean, as much as he argued with me every single game, it's, it was bad. <laughs> but uh, he's a good mate of mine as well. So it's, uh, you know, he could he could win you a game. Uh, and then on the left-hand side, I'm going to go for Stevie Lawless. It was a toss-up between him and Squiddy, but I just think because Squiddy left us for Dundee United <laughs> after the championship, I'm going to leave him out. <laughs> so I, mean, I went for Stevie Lawless because... He's a great wee player. Um, one of these boys that you probably don't realise how good he is until you play with him. But you could get out of tight situations, you could create, you could score. And again, one of these players that probably should have had a better career than what he's had. Um, no disrespect to Livingston or, or Motherwell, but you know, in my opinion, you could easily have played at a, a higher level or a, a bigger club than what you know, Livingston is. Um, and then this is probably the most controversial one most people will probably put duels in there, but I am just going to go on pure talent and what I thought he brought to the team is I'm going to go for Lyle Taylor. Um, just because he had everything. He could score goals, he could run, he could head the ball, he could hold it up. He was a kind of centre-half nightmare to play against, mm-hmm. a centre-half dream to play with because you knew that you could put it in behind you and he would, he would run for it and you knew that if you dropped it in, defeat you you could you could hold it up. And I think when he came into the club, there was a massive difference. And that's no disrespect to any, you know, players because I think Duels is fantastic as well. It's um, you know, he's a club legend, he's a great guy and he has done unbelievable, you know, with the amount of goals he scored. And um, but what Tail Tails offered was a little bit more than what Duels Duels did in certain situations. And that's just why I, I thought I'd go with uh, Lyle. And then I've just done a bench just for, for banner. Um, <laughs> so I've done two for six players and then I've put myself in that. So that's seven. Um, Paul Kenny, people might be surprised at that, but at the time when I first came, he was he was very good. I think the season that he got his move to Hibs, he was, you know, he'd done really well. I, remember, he, I don't know if anyone remembers his hat-trick against Dundee. Um, he scored some really, really nice goals. I think he scored a lovely chip as well, actually. Um that not many people can. Remember. My goalkeeper is going to be Paul Gallagher. I think he did really well when he played. And I actually didn't play with many goalkeepers at um, at Thistle, believe it or not. So, um, I think Foxy and him were probably the main two players that I played with. Um, going to go for my best mate James Craig and just put him in there so I don't get abuse. <laughs> and just for that goal against Morton. Yeah. And then uh, Chris Erskine because of what he can. You know, offer off the bench with his you know, octopus legs and stuff like that, and then Chris Doolan clearly for you know coming on and scoring goals and doing what he does as well. And then mm-hmm. I put um, Aaron Muirhead as well, as I think actually he probably doesn't get a lot of recognition because you know he he didn't stay for that long. But mm-hmm. the year that he won the league, he was he was great. I mean, he kept me out of the team, him and Archie for you know a good number of games. 
And then when me and him played, and he was still fantastic. He scored a lot of goals that year as well. Um, so he, he, he's, I actually think he's a, he's a good player. Um, mm-hmm. He's had a good year as well in the championship. So fair play to the guy. And then obviously myself, just sitting on the bench, giving abuse to the linesman. <laughs> You've nearly got a team on the bench that would give the, the starting eleven a good game there if you had yeah. four more in. That's that shows the depth and quality. It, it, it was difficult, to be honest, because it, it was a toss-up between, obviously, uh, Stevie and uh, Chris Erskine and Lyle Taylor and Doolan. Um, but, yeah, it was it's one of these things, you know, I just thought that team on paper, to me, has got a bit of everything about it. I um, don't think many teams would be able to match the energy that they have. Definitely, definitely. There's obviously loads of fond memories of this 12 13 team in particular, and you know, you guys clearly get on very well. I mean, have you kept in touch with players throughout your you know, your, your yeah. full term at uh, Thistle? Yeah, so uh, Foxy's a client of mine, so I speak to him quite a lot. <laughs> um, speak to speak to Sinky uh, a fair bit, well, not a fair bit, but I speak to him just seeing how he's getting yeah. on. Welshy, you know, good mate of mine, so I speak to him pretty much every day in the, in the WhatsApp group that we've got. Pates, I speak to, you know, every now and again. Cragsy, James Craig, and probably one of my best mates, so I speak to him pretty much every every day. Um, also a client of mine, so that's good. Higgy, speak to him, play Warzone, play Call of Duty with Higgy, so uh, I feel like I'm back on the pitch when he's absolutely shouting to me, you know, shoot someone, and I'm just like, where about? And they're like, <laughs> over here, and I'm like, I don't know where. Um, Stevie Lawless, yes, speak to him every now and again. Duel, speak to Squid, Squiddy, speak to so yeah, I speak to a lot of players, um, yeah. and it's, it kind of sums it up that we um, we ended up still being friends. You know, you don't get a lot of that in football any, anymore. It's you know, you play for a team and then you move on, and then you don't really speak to anyone. But you know, because of what we've done, it's it's always nice to to stay in contact. I think probably the ten year anniversary would be quite interesting. Hopefully, the uh, the pubs are open by then. Not half, not half. Um... No, that's a, that's a lovely way to finish, Conrad. I guess um, we can also see if where they're hiding their medals as well. And if, uh, yeah. you all turn up, t- turn up with rucksacks in your back. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, absolutely fabulous taking that trip down memory lane. Really appreciate your time. It's a formidable starting eleven, um, and and you know I'm sure Thistle fans like me will, will just enjoy listening to you and all the happy memories we could have. There's dozens of other games we could have talked about and gone into more detail in other seasons, maybe another time when we get far open again. We can get you up to speak to the fans in the bars and, and go over more of the memories. That'd be great. I've actually I've got something written down here that we've not I've not actually been able to to get onto. It was a funny story about um something that happened to me with Boy Craig Hinchcliffe. You know, remember the yeah. roller coach? Uh, I'll just tell it because it's funny. So go on. we were um car share and we were at the lights going uh, back home so you know when you come out uh, onto the main road and you come up and there's like the the car wash on the left hand yep. side so we were at the lights there and we're just going to go straight forward and we had uh, Hinchy in the car next to us and we were in the car here so me, JC and Welshy and we were like hey what should we do here so we're like right, Hinchy wind, wind your window down so we won't uh, when was window down we're like ah oh. lights went green and we went hey we squirted him with the porter right <laughs> got, got him a absolute beauty and he drove in and he, he had a, quite a fast car at the time so I mean we, we had a wee I don't know what we had at the time but it wasn't as fast as his so we started driving away he just scooted on past us literally cut in in front of us stopped us from driving got out and tried to open I was raging <laughs> he was trying to open the doors and he was like get in get the hell out of here and all that and we were like no and he got back in his car right and he went away and he was like we thought we were like oh my god like what's just happened here anyway the next again day we were training and i've come back to to the stand uh, to the to the stadium to get changed and i'm like where's my gear and i'm like what's happened here and and he looks at me and he's laughing and i'm like oh what's he done here and i walk out into the pitch and i see my jeans up on the up on like a podium up on the the stand where there's no it was like the what's it called the the bit the big behind the goal aye so the one that's not going to stand yeah yeah was like a podium there my jeans were there and I'm thinking where's my jumper and he's like laughing and I just see my jumper up on the big main stand hanging down from the roof <laughs> and I'm like 
oh no, how the hell am I going to get this? So I've had to like go into the, I think it's the Jackie Elson stand, and go all the way up to the top, actually get onto the roof, Jeez. walk down the roof and pick up my stuff because of what we've done to him. <laughs> and I was like, I could, I could literally die here and we're in the middle of a title challenge. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it just kind of summed it all up like we had like it was raging at the time but we had good banter like throughout the yeah. throughout the season it was, just, it was just brilliant so I, I, I should have mentioned that earlier but I just thought I <laughs> I bet you never, never played a joke on him again no no well yeah he's a he's a big angry guy but he's a, he's a great guy in Fo- Foxy stuff he's at Motherwell now with Foxy so I yeah. still hear stories about him so it's quite funny superb Superb, right. We've got more of those stories to look forward to next time we speak to you, I'm sure. Um, on behalf of all the Thistle fans, Conrad, thanks again for your time and um, obviously take care over the next few months and hopefully see you back at Fur Hill soon. No problem. Thank you very much for having me. Much appreciated.